the Keats relationship between the previous and the final member is a genitive case relationship. Of. We can have all the other case relationships that is accusative, dative, locative, instrumental, and so forth. So it can be by, of, in, from, and so forth. This is what's known as a Tatpurusha compound. And we have an enormous number of them in Sanskrit and in Tibetan. It's, we can call it a dependent determinative compound, as opposed to the next one, which is a descriptive in determinative compound. Uh, Say, for example, that we have Deva Rishi Sai Jansom in Tibet. A Rishi, a seer who is a Deva. In other words, it's not the seer of the Deva as if he had his pet seer. It's one who is a deva, is a god. Now, in Tibetan, this would be given as Hlai Dongsong. In other words, you can hear a genitive case there. So, you may be th thinking, whoa, wait a minute. Does this actually come out to be a kind of tatpurusha? No. The genitive, and this is one of the pleasant things in Tibetan, can be used to indicate possession, is often used to indicate possession in a tatpurusha compound, but it is also used in a descriptive determinative compound, that is a karmadarya, as in this particular case. That is, it is a seer who is a god. To take another example with a genitive being used in this way, readers of elementary logic texts probably know Sutlayena, or Sutkechelayena, Niyore, Kadotta Yikisu. In other words, the division of form into shapes and colors. Now what's that term in Tibetan? Yip Kisu in Sanskrit, Samstana Rupa. Note that we have a genitive there, but it's not a genitive of possession, it's a genitive of which is a descriptive compound. That is, it is the matter or the form which is or which consists in shape. You still okay? Good. Um, okay. These compounds, as I said before, can be combined in very complex ways. But for the moment, I'm trying to take the most simple paradigm types of cases. And these two, in a sense, are very closely related. They're determinative compounds, but they work differently. This one is if we have a compound. So here we are again, the fun with technology and Sanskrit compounds. Um, I was saying that these two are related in the sense that they are both determinative compounds, uh, but the one is just, but they function in a different way. Uh, in that this one will use of like cases, and this one, the karmadarya, the descriptive one, um, in a sense uses the nominative case. That is, it's saying that a certain X 
is why, not that it comes from or that it is in or in some other kind of oblique case like that. So descriptive in the sense that it provides a description, a further specification of uh, the last member of the compound. Now let's move on. I was previously I was at this uh, talking about the Bahovrihin's Drumman, the so-called ex exocentric compound. Bahovrihi, someone who has a lot of rice. Was rich. Exocentric, why? Because they refer to and actually modify a, uh, another noun. So, for example, we might have someone who is, it's not a flattering thing to say, is horse faced. Ashvamukha. Or we might have a family which is a two-car family. Or we might have someone dark in color, Krishnavarna. These types of compounds are very often, but not always, indicated in Tibetan with the chen. Chana chen. Who has as nimbo, as garba, as essence, as embryo, the Tathagata. That is an exocentric compound. That's one interpretation of the term Tathagata garba as an exocentric compound, as essentially an adjectival compound. One way to render a bahuri, an exocentric or adjectival compound, is simply by saying who has as face or who has x as y. For example, who has as essence the tatagata? or having as essence the Tathagata. In other words, this person, or every person, or every sentient being, has as essence the Tathagata. It modifies every sentient being. This person has a face which is like a horse. It's horse-faced. That's also, it's not a very flattering one, is a Bahovrihi compound. Okay, those are the basic structures. That, and they constitute the type of analysis which one has to apply, or at least be able to apply if called upon, and sometimes in an iterated fashion, in order to interpret a Sanskrit or a Tibetan compound. Now, do we have to do this? Isn't there a risk of error because we're interpreting? Darn right. There sure is a risk of error. But we have to live dangerously. The alternative of simply making a very, very long English compound of where you have, say, seven members and you just put them together, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yields nonsense. Whether you're a Tibetan, whether you're an English, uh, an Indian commentator, whether you're an English translator, you have to interpret. They all did. We do too. We don't have a safe solution of just at least in difficult cases, just listing a kind of concatenation of the elements. So, we need to do two things. One, we need to analyze. How do you analyze? Well, you analyze in terms of what's possible. 
and what makes sense.